Well, good morning and welcome to the sixth annual and first virtual Charter School Leaders of Color Capitol Hill Advocacy Initiative convening. Uh, for the returners, I wanna welcome you all back for another year. We are proud to say that we have over 45 leaders of color, African-American, Latinx, Asian, and Native American leaders joining us from over 18 states in the District of Columbia this year. For the newbies, we welcome you here for the first time. We're sorry that we could not be in person and face-to-face -face and have a real good experience one-on-one uh, -on -one in Washington, D.C., uh, but we're glad you, chose, you thought it not robbery, as they say in my church, to join us uh, for, this, uh, for this virtual convening. Uh, and we'll teach you the secret handshake uh, when we see you again personally. <laughs> For those of you that are just here to view for the first time, our first open to the general public session, let me tell you a little bit about this endeavor. Um, for six years now, we have uh, provided an opportunity uh, for some of the leading uh, charter school leaders of color from across this nation of high quality, um, high performing schools to showcase what they do how they do it and their commitment to their communities directly with their federal representatives on the Hill. Uh, our first day uh, uh, consists of uh, interacting with one another, sharing sessions that help uh, with uh, their own peer-to-peer -peer development and in their schools with consultancies and, and funding and other, other issues uh, that are, are germane to their leaders, uh, the leaders that participate uh, and their ongoing um, uh, continuing uh, fight in the community and within their schools to 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 have high results. Uh, and the second day is their attempt to cut out the middleman and cut right through the anti-charter rhetoric uh, to speak directly with their federal representatives about what is actually happening in their schools. In the age of, of us talking about equity, uh, the views, experiences, and achievements uh, of these leaders are required in any discussion about self-determination. And so I'm proud that you are here and I'm proud that the National Alliance has provided an opportunity for us to get together. And since we've started, there have been, uh, we've been joined uh, and supported to a, to, and, and surpassed to a certain degree uh, by a lot of organizations, by the growth of other partner organizations like the Diverse Charter Schools Coalition and the creation of the National Charter Collaborative and, and the Freedom Coalition of Charter Schools to continue to fight uh, for what is right uh, and best about the schools and the school leaders in our community. Uh, and, and we use these opportunities to continue mutually talking about these issues at their respective convenings and at our own conference, which will be uh, this year, June 20th through the 23rd. So now on to our panel. Um, Roland Martin and uh, a number of, uh, as, as what Roland Martin has said at an Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Convention uh, in Las Vegas a few years ago, that the, uh, the, the members of the National Panhellenic Council, the Divine Nine, should really be about the task of, of, of moving their educational mission forward that all of our organizations have. I'm a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, but all of our organizations have a mission about educational excellence and providing those quality uh, access to all of our to the, the students that we mentor uh, and that ultimately join our respective organizations. And he challenged all those organizations to create charter schools uh, so that they could be the heads and uh, of their own uh, schools, but also to convey those missions uh, that are that are in uh, our, our respective organizations uh, in a day to day school. And so, and because of the number of, of of members of our respective organizations that head incredible charter schools, Tim King and Urban Prep in Chicago, uh, and another Ticey McDowell with Crossroads in Missouri, who's a member of Zeta Phi Beta, uh, there is. Uh, a, a need for us to engage with those organizations that many of us are members of, uh, and many of those uh, local chapters that support charter schools going forward. I'm pleased to be joined by one of those incredible school leaders, uh, Ray Ingram, who's a proud member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, and also the CEO of an incredible charter school, Riverhead in New York, uh, to lead this discussion uh, and to have us talk about uh, this with, some, with an esteemed panel uh, going forward about the future of charter schools led by people of color uh, and, and the relationship we have with the Divine Nine. So without further ado, Ray, the chair, the chair is yours. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, 
thanks for uh, the opportunity. And uh, I look forward to embarking on this conversation with, with our esteemed panel. So really quickly, if we could just go through uh, the panel and folks can just say where they're from and what organization they represent, that would be super smooth. We could start with you, Ron. Are you still in the- Still here. You know, um, yeah. So I'm Ron Rice. I'm the senior director uh, uh, for government relations, the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, a proud member of uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated uh, by way of New Beta Chapter in Washington, D.C., current member of Omicron Ada Lambda Chapter in Washington, D.C. Uh, next part. I, I can't see the. Um... So, Ron, you, you call out the next person, sir. Uh, why don't we have uh, 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 Lauren Festa? Feaster, sorry, Lauren. Hey, hey, yes, yes. My name is Lauren Feaster. I'm proud to be here with you all today, um, representing Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated by way of Epsilon Xi chapter um, at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So I'm out here in Milwaukee, um, freezing, along with everybody else in the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, my work, um, my work is really rooted in looking at um, charter lick. Um, the divisiveness of those divisions in Milwaukee specifically, but um, really my exposure has been with my with programs um, affiliated with um, these schools. So helped bring City Year here about ten years ago, and then um, was involved in philanthropy fundraising um, and chief of staff for both organizations and with Teach for America Milwaukee. Happy to be here. We're gonna go to Tim Woods next, Ray. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Woods. I am the uh, 24th uh, Western Province Promar for Cap Alpha Psi. That's the uh, Western Regional President for the, uh, uh, the Western states, including um, um, uh, Alaska, Hawaii. Um, we have chapters in uh, the Republic of uh, South Korea and in Japan. Um, so I'm here to represent uh, our organization. I'm a uh, Spring 1990 initiate of uh, Cap Alpha Psi fraternity. So uh, next person, Mr. Swanson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Dondrell Swanson. I am the Western Region Vice President for Alpha Phi Alpha. I cover many of the same territories that Tim just mentioned for Kappa Alpha Psi. We have similar organizational alignment in that way. But I also chair the Alpha Community Education Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization that is really focused around fiscal transparency, uh, bringing more equity to student discipline, and then finally expanding that pipeline to educators of color. And so we're a little bit more engaged on both the policy side, as well as looking to eventually open our own charter school, answering the call that uh, our brother Roland Martin laid out there as articulated by Ron Rice. And finally, Lauren, not all of us are freezing. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump in, man. We don't have that much time together, so let's make sure that we're uh, being productive. Uh, Lauren, we'll start with you, and this will be a whip around question for everybody. Um, so what are your thoughts on the current state of K-12 education for uh, black and brown students? Um, the current state mo more broadly to me is unacceptable, and I don't wanna diminish the hard work of all the folks that are leading. I'm just putting it out there, and I don't think that it's all, it's all our fault either. We're, we're building systems in a larger, a larger world and system that was not designed for our kids to, to succeed, and which is why I'm very supportive of anything that gives us the ability to lead and have our own. Um, so that includes charter and choice schools, as well as um, working our ways up through public schools as well. Um, I also think one of the biggest mistakes that we're making when it comes to education is thinking that that it all lives in the hands of educators and folks working in schools. Education, as, as already noted and mentioned, is a multifaceted responsibility and issue. It comes in the, comes with, all things come to a head in the classroom, of course, but it's everyone's responsibility, which is why I'm very passionate about this work. Um, now that I'm in the business community, um, bring it, making sure that somebody is advocating for that um, and for our kids. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Swanson, we'll go to you and then uh, to Mr. Woods. I think Lauren said it well, it's, it's unacceptable. Uh, and I agree with her, we don't want to be smirched. There are some just real 
heroes and she rolls and absolute champions out there doing tremendous work in the space of public education. I am a product of public education, so I embrace it. But at the same time, when we look at what's happening with black and, black and brown children, particularly around suspensions, particularly around expulsions, particularly around some of our school districts that are dominated by black and brown students that are having uh, lots of fiscal turmoil and um, underqualified teachers in the spaces, there's a lot of things that we really need to fix. Uh, right now, we have a system that is producing inadequate outcomes. And so we really need to either positively, well, I won't say either, we really need to do both. We need to positively impact that system and that space, and at the same time, continue to advocate for choice and allow it its space to flourish and continue to push public schools to perform at a much higher level, because uh, by us accepting it, we are failing our children. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Mr. Woods. Uh, I would echo um, uh, many of the things that the two panelists um, before me have already said. Um, we we are still, to me, still suffering from the remnants of slavery and the inadequacies of, of education that um, perpetuated itself then and that continue to this day. Um, we see uh, our, our our young brothers and sisters uh, coming to college who are not uh, equipped for college. Um, they, they are, you know, you can see it in the grade point averages. They just, they're just not ready. Um, and, it's, and it hasn't, um, we, we've had people who've been doing some stellar work like uh, Don Drill has said, but we just, we're just still in that catch up phase. And we just have to really um, uh, put an emphasis on getting our, our, our young people up to par, getting educators that care about our, our young people and uh, exposing them to, to the things that they need to be exposed to so that they're equipped to uh, be able to help in this 21st century and then in, into the 22nd century where they will be. So we got a lot of work uh, that we need to do to get our folks up to where they need to be. <laughs> you, you bet. <laughs> we definitely got a lot of work, man. Thanks for that. And so I'm excited because this panel is live and uh and this first round of questions, man. I definitely learned a lot. So hopefully if you're in the audience, uh you're learning as well. And if you have any questions in the audience, please put it in the QA and we'll happily address those. So second question for the panelists and Mr. Woods, we'll start with you uh since we ended with you last. Is uh prior to Brown versus Board, or there was an influx of black educators making a difference. Nowadays, there's less than 2% uh, male teachers nationwide. How can your respective organization influence uh, black males to enter the K-12 space? Um, that, and that's a real, a really good question. So, you know, when you look at uh, uh, segregation uh, prior to, it was us, us teaching ours. Um, um, that was, that was a primary emphasis, but with desegregation and people spreading out all over the place, people are looking at opportunities. And one of the unfortunate things about education right now is we pay our educators less, uh, money than, um, we pay our corporate execs, we pay them less money than we pay police officers, the profession that I just retired from, um, I had a master's degree in educational leadership and development, and I was making twice as much money as the teachers that were in the school when I was a school resource officer. Now, I'm, I'm not complaining about the money that I was making, but what I'm saying is, is if we, we're charging teachers with educating our future, we need to make it attractive for them to go into the field so that they're not going into these other fields and looking at just making money and trying to put a vested interest in our children. So there's a pay inequity that we need to address with teachers so that we can attract the best and the brightest. And hopefully that will be attracting more male teachers um, as well as our female sisters into the uh, the field. Yeah, okay. So Mr. Swanson, we'll come to you and then Ms. Feaster. Sure, this is a very nuanced uh, conversation. I, while I agree with uh, with uh, my, my good fratter, Tim Woods, that um, the compensation is, is not aligned uh, and there's opportunities for that um, to be improved. I really think that our organizations though can really be a conduit towards expanding this pipeline of educators and administrators, right? I mean, um, we have school districts where we are still talking about the only African-American child in the classroom, the only uh, young Hispanic man in the, in the classroom. And then when you look at the specific disaggregated data around expulsions, 
uh, uh, Native American children as the work that's been done with some folks in California are being expelled at astronomical rates. Uh, African American boys uh, are being continuously viewed as disruptive. And so we have issues with them being disciplined in ways that um, are very disproportionate to their representation. And so how our organizations can partner is we can do more mentoring with some of these schools. Mm. We can bring some of our programs and many things that our organizations already do on a regular basis. We can partner with some of these schools that have administrators um, that are open to it and try to expand that. Um, I know the Kappas have a reading program. Us in the Western region of Alpha, we've developed a book that we use with our youth. We can bring these programs right to these schools and try to improve those opportunities. We all do drives to raise money. Um, how about doing some book drives or some supply drives at some of these schools? Uh, those are great opportunities for us to partner with them and, and grow and expand and increase the exposure so that when we increase the exposure of where these, uh, of us knowing where the schools are located, knowing who's in those schools, potentially we can also expand our influence as an organization so that they can look to us and look to hire more folks from our organizations as well. Lauren. I agree with all of that. Um, very nuanced and complex. And one thing I would name is that Education is not the only sector that struggles to recruit and retain, um, elevate black and brown leadership. And so I think that there are some really strong practices that we could learn from business communities. And even, and I'm speaking from Milwaukee, a city that um, is not always seen as the most sexy city, but has allowed us to evolve the way that we think about attracting and retaining talent. Um, I think that there are strategies that we can learn there. Um, as we think about pipeline and um, especially uh, as, as Dondrell named what, what we have the opportunity to do by way of being a part of this organization. So I think there's, um, I always believe that things start at the top. So there's an important, um, there's an importance around what we name as a priority um, as an organization. And as I'm thinking specifically about Sigma Gamma Rho being founded by teachers and having so many sorors that are educators and leading buildings and leading the work a big opportunity to really think about that natural pipeline as we're as we're connecting with women and they're graduating from college or women in the community um, and talking to them about the importance of the education of our of our kids. Um, so whether that means that you go into education more traditionally or you end up in another field, you still have a dedication and commitment to building that pipeline, to contributing to it, um, to raising the profile of teachers. And, and we benefit from raising a profile of our organization. That's like what we do when we, when we represent our org, when we talk about it, the, the discipline that we have, we're good at that. So we mm -hmm. need to use those skills to raise the profile of our educators as well. And so what does it mean when a teacher walks in the room? What does it mean when they enter an establishment? Do they have certain, you know, are there, is there a certain way we treat them? Um, do we not let them put the, uh, their jacket or blazer on the ground um, when, they, when, they, when they're representing their school, you know? So I think that there's a lot that we, that we can do by way of our own kind of tradition um, that can really raise the profile of, of an educator um, and the role of the educator. Uh, Omega Sapphire is a non-hazing organization. So I just wanna just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanna slide that in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I I know um I got a former uh, school resource officer on here, so you know we move with with the energy of 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 the panelists, and so um <laughs> the school to prison pipeline um you know for African Americans make up fourteen percent of the total population in the United States, yet we make up about forty seven percent of uh the population of prisons in the United States. How do we get kids on a path uh, a path to college? and not a path to prison. Uh, Mr. Woods, we'll start with you, sir. Ooh, man, you want me to take up the rest of your time with this. So <laughs> um, let, 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 me just, let me just say this, and I'm gonna try to be as succinct as I possibly can with this. We need to understand first and foremost that our police departments were designed to control the movements of black people. OK, we can look back. Police departments in the, in the United States of America started with slave patrols. We have not changed that mindset. Um, and you can look at it through slave patrols, through Recon uh, Civil War Reconstruction, through the Jim Crow laws, the convict leasing, 
all these things are still uh, perpetuating themselves today. And there are, when, you, when you're talking about building private prisons and you're making laws so that you can uh, keep these private prisons filled, that is a problem. It is, a, it, is a, it is in diametric opposition of education. So we have to um, uh, start with making sure that at the youngest ages, when when we when we were young and they they had that commercial uh, uh, that said reading is fundamental that was the, the truest statement of all. If our young kids do not learn how to read and write at an early age, then they are going to be tracked uh, into that that pipeline. We we're we're talking. Merrick Garland is talking today. Um, as Cory Booker yesterday asked him questions about the disparity in, in sentencing, and he admitted that there is a disparity in sentencing of people of color. These are the things that we have to we have to fight first and foremost, and then equip our children um, uh, with reading at an early age. And not just we can't lay this on teachers. Parents have to be actively involved in working with their children. And if they don't have those tools, that's where our organization should be able to come in and help parents who don't have the resources and the tools to, to augment what they're getting in schools with our, with our various mentoring programs. And we have to be more active, more vocal in this, because if we don't, there are there are industries out there that will track our kids into those prison those prisons because prisons are profitable okay so and that's what we we got to stop that yeah um swanson you got anything to add there's no two minute answer to this question <laughs> i'm not <laughs> hey i didn't put a limit I, I don't put limitations on folks man uh, I mean, the, the, the amount of, uh, of, of arrows at which we need to approach this question are rather extensive. Uh, but it starts with, and I think the point that uh, uh, Tim Woods was making is that we need to get racism out of the police department. We need to stop accepting the answer that there are a few bad apples, right? There's just certain occupations where we can't have a few bad apples. And at what point is a few too many? And if we can get that kind of racism and that kind of ideology that views our children as a criminal or as problematic, I think that will help with us uh, putting few of them in prison. I heard it once put this way, you know, if, if, if you had a cat who went to trial and the whole jury were dogs, that cat would, 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 would not have a, a great chance of being viewed as innocent. And so we need to have not only more people of color and more diverse police departments, but we also got to get a lot of that racism out of the police department. I agree that we need to also stop underfunding programs that um, provide support for pre-K. Um, you know, it used to be programs like Head Start, where we provide those resources to help edify these children and teach them about not only their wealth, but also get them ready to start uh, school. And so we um, have essentially bankrupted a lot of funding out of those programs. And so that's tremendous opportunity for us to provide more support and, and readiness. Um, we are also having opportunities for us to do more in terms of parent support, parent mentorship. That I think plays a role in this. And then it gets down to everything we're talking about with what's, what's going on in the schools. Are we having diverse educators? Are we getting rid of the suspension programs? When African-American and Hispanic or black and brown children are being suspended at astronomical rates, that increases the likelihood that they will not be successful. Um, you know, attendance is critical to success in our school systems. And when we're constantly being kicked out of there, that's not happening. And then um, we need to um, stop accepting mediocre performance by many of our schools in our school districts. Um, we accept unacceptable terms. We allow teacher unions in some cases to get away with just absolutely unacceptable things. And, and at the end of the day, it gets to what I've said earlier that we are failing our children by accepting these things. I'll pause right there, but I, I, I'll just close with this comment that um, we could go on for another 15 minutes outlining other issues that are all contributing to this pipeline. And what I did never get to, which is important is that this uh, uh, idea of uh, profit, profitable prisons and the incentives around us continuing to fill these populations, uh, we need to disincent those programs as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Lauren and, and, and get off this one. <laughs> There's not much.
much more I can do with this. I mean, I think you all named it. Um, this this uh, this type of change really. I think the answer to this question depends on where you sit and where you hold influence and really people looking at their locus of control and driving driving what's within that. So if you're directly facing students, you're thinking about the curriculum you're providing them, the, the knowledge that you're providing them, Tim mentioned being able to read um, your basic, you know, your basic requirements. If you're working, uh, if you're a voter, like how are you thinking about the people that we're putting in office and, and over these types of uh, decisions? Um, and I mean, you're dead on as far as just like the, the, the fact, the education, people not being educated is not why they're, why they're going to jail. That's a, there's a system for that. Um, and so I think really it takes um, asking yourself that question and really holding our, our leadership accountable to having real answers and accountability around, the, around how they plan to interrupt it from whatever seat they sit in. And so one of the one of the most important points that resonated for me in all three of y'all's uh, correspondence is that um, talk about the racism in the police departments. Well, you know, those police departments, uh, they, they share a similar union with uh, the teachers. <laughs> and so if you see <laughs> if you're seeing uh, racism in the police departments, imagine what our babies are seeing when they come into these schools every day with 80 percent of their teachers that identify as white. I mean, it's gotta be a struggle for them, right? And so that kind of segues me to the next question is, you know, there's a help, healthy competition between, you know, fraternities and sororities and, and the D9, you know, it's, it's, it's healthy, you know, it's, it's natural. I think our founders wanted it to be this way. Um, how can we combine our efforts and coalesce uh, with improving education for black and brown students? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's always like this competition, you know, who's better, who's this, who's that, but how can we all be great and just, uh, and be great for students? Uh, Lauren, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, for those who, of us, well, our onboarding to our organizations has a lot to do with, <laughs> with how we believe about, with what we believe um, about unity. But like, that's always, it's always, we're, we're all black first. I mean, historically, like obviously we're diverse, but we all have a common mission when we come into these organizations, assuming that we're onboarded correctly. And I think that we need to, um, really think about how that actually brings us together and how we can utilize our different strengths, which I think connects to some of the other points too about retention and talent. I don't think that we give enough um, energy around like what it really takes to manage and, and build and develop and empower people. Um, that's, that's a lot of work. Um, that's not just something, you don't just hire people and like let them go. There's, there's a lot of work that comes in developing somebody who's gonna be ill and consistent and true and take take our work to the next level. So just really investing in ourselves and um, our own learnings, uh, I think to me is very important. And, and maybe developing a platform that we can share these experiences and a little bit of strategy um, could go a long way as well. So I said, we're coming to you, but uh, Lauren, that onboarding word is a trigger. <laughs> <laughs> it's very well said though. Very well said. Very well, well yeah. Onboarding. Yeah, I'm back <laughs> that. You know, unpack that another time. Therapy is good. <laughs> <laughs> Swanson, your thoughts? Well, um, honestly, I think that we are partnering in doing these things in a lot of ways. That doesn't mean that there's not opportunity for improvement. Uh, but when you look at some of the uh, collaborations that have taken around capital days uh, with us collectively as D9 organizations going down to advocate for policies that impact our community in positive ways, I think that's happening. Um, I saw just as many members of Sigma Gamma Rho and Delta Sigma Theta advocating to get Kamala Harris elected as I saw AKAs. Um, so I think these things are happening. Um, Tim and I both have our respective positions in our organizations. We both live here in Arizona. If something's going on and the alphas are not involved, Tim will reach out to me and say, hey man, what are you guys doing in this space? And I will do the same uh, with him and for him. Uh, so I think it's important. I think that um, we need to be mindful though that if we don't continue to push one another to determine which organizations are best, we will find ourselves in the conversation of which organizations will survive. 
because as it relates to this conversation, if we don't have more African-American young men to grow up and marry members of Sigma Gamma Rho and to become members of Kappa Alpha Psi or Omega Psi Phi um, or Alpha Phi Alpha, then we will have a bigger problem on our hands. And so education and the success of our education, <coughs> our organizations are, are, we rely upon it where our success is, is demands that those systems are successful. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Woods. So, uh, you know, as far as collaborating, um, so I'm on this call today uh, only because Dondro called me yesterday and said, hey, I did not see you guys represented. So um, I just, I think this is something important that um, you guys need to be involved in. And like you said, we, we communicate and collaborate all all the time um, as organizations, because at this stage of the game, we understand we're grown folks. Um, and that when I walk into a room, the first thing they're gonna see is my black face, not my letters of Kappa Alpha Psi, or not Alpha Alpha, it's Omega Psi Phi, Sigma Gamma Rho, and the rest of the D9. They're not gonna see that, they're gonna see that black face. And we need to understand, and I think we do um, understand as we get, like I say, as grown folks, um, when, when we, we get past the, uh, and there's nothing wrong with your college days in your organization. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having pride in your organization in those college days and continuing that. I mean, I, I am, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a capital through and through, but I also recognize that I'm, I was born a black man first, um, and that if my if I am not helping other black people, then there is a fundamental flaw at, at what I'm doing in my organization. Um, there's a fundamental flaw when I when I tell myself I cannot help my sisters if they're having a program. I cannot help my other brothers from uh, other organizations. And whenever the other organizations and I tell our young folks that are on this call, when other organizations reach out to you and want to collaborate. It is a, a position of power and strength in order to be able to do that. Did he freeze? Don't worry, I got you. <laughs> 1911 combined. All right. So um, we got a question from the uh, from the from the audience. Um, it, it says, uh, "What strategy do you suggest uh, to implement to address the learning loss uh, caused by the pandemic?" So I want to make sure I get to that uh, the question before we uh, interweave the rest of the rest of the questions that I have. And so, uh, Swanson, we'll start with you. What, what are your thoughts on this question? I think find ways to supplement the education that kids are getting from schools. There's a lot of different online uh, vehicles available to our students. Some are free, some cost money, uh, but we got to go ahead and supplement that. We got to be engaged with our kids, uh, whether you're a parent or a guardian. Uh, what are they learning and being involved? I have a young child who's at home. And when you ask her, is all your work done? The answer is yes. And then I uh, go <laughs> to the and take a look. And the answer is not yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get on that right now. Um, so we have to be involved and engaged. Uh, and then we have to take advantage of a number of these resources that are out there. Um, you know, there's Khan Academy. I'm amazed at how much is available on YouTube. Uh, our kids are learning things through TikTok. Um, we can leverage things that they like and find education there, but we first have to understand where they are and then figure out how do we supplement that. Yeah, Lauren. Yeah, now, now is the time. I think most Black kids are, do not need to return to whatever, whatever we had going on before because it wasn't it wasn't good enough. And I think now more than ever is the time to get creative um, about really asserting what's necessary for your kids and the kids in your life. Um, we now have access by way of, by way of the sh virtual shift um, to so much more than we had before. And um, at this point, it's about like our schedules and prioritization and really making sure that students all have an advocate, an educational advocate, whether that is in, in more privileged places can be the parent um, or a guardian or if it's a community member or somebody needs to be advocating for the educational um, ex excellence of our students. And I think that that's a, a small step is making sure all the kids in your life have an advocate, somebody checking their grades, checking on them and saying that they can just focus on, on them getting to where they should be um, so they can have access to, to more and empower themselves. Yeah, I think uh, in answering this question, 
um, one of the most important things that's, that, that we're going to have to utilize, and I know some people may not agree with this on the panel, and that's fine. We can dialogue about it. It's like standardized testing. So Joe Biden came out yesterday, and he was like, you know, uh, standardized tests nationwide, um, and that he's, uh, you know, it, folks won't be accountable for the results, given the fact that, you know, we've lost so much during COVID. But I think it's important for Black and brown parents to know where their kids are. And, uh, you know, there's some issues and problems that may uh, exist with standardized testing. But right now, you know, that's like the best tool that we have to know where our kids are. And so, you know, next fall, when I get this report on my daughter and it tells me exactly what she has mastered in comparison to her peers, then I know what I need to do in order to in order to supplement uh, her education, in order to make sure that, you know, she has what she needs in terms of uh, being competitive on a global market. So I just wanted to add that. Uh, we got another, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that I, I disagree with your notion about standardized testing, but I also think we have an opportunity to try and take some of the bias out of standardized testing. And I also think by not acknowledging that bias, we end up, um, dis, uh, we, we end up putting some of our kids in an unfair position. And then when it starts to be used to judge their intellectual levels, when there's biases that are implicit in there, um, I think that doesn't work. And we know that one of the best indicators of your performance on a standardized test is your zip code, uh, not necessarily your school. And so those are the pieces where I think we can come together with advocating for standardized testing, but at the same time advocating for stripping many of the biases out of it. Okay, so I'm gonna push you. Okay, right? okay. Because would you rather a teacher developed assessment or an assessment that's developed by a psychometrician? Because if you're looking at biases, you have 80% of teachers that identify as, so like those teacher made assessments are gonna be just as biased mm -hmm. or no, I don't know. No, I, I don't disagree with you, but I don't think it's an either or conversation. Mm -hmm. I think we need to bring all of these people to the table in a way that is very constructive, that is focused on developing outcomes, not in a way that is a committee where it never gets done, but in a way where we have some minds who are sensitive to the issues and the challenges that we have before us and kind of get focused on uh, that one determined outcome uh, that is a lot more acceptable than where we are today. Love it. Anybody else got anything to add before we move on? Yeah, I, you know, the one thing I would say about standardized tests is, is, is you got to look at, like you said, who, who's developing the test. So I'm not, you know, too sure that a teacher needs to be maybe developing that test. But let's let's look at if you if you're using let's look at real life uh, situations. So why, why don't we look at, OK, what what's needed in that area? For example, um, if if I'm if I'm uh, going into the field of, uh, of, of engineering, um, why don't I let the engineer who's actually in that field say that's, that has relevance today, not something like 50 years ago, come up with, here's the practical problems and solutions that we have that need to be solved. And I need you to solve this problem. Um, so the, that it's it, there's a baseline there versus, like you say, putting somebody's bias in it. We do that all the time. That's the problem. And I get back to policing. That's the problem with policing. You got police developing the processes for being police, and they don't understand the dynamics of what the people in the community want and expect of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but any, anything that you say towards the police, I just mirror that to the teachers. So, because, <laughs> hey, they got the same union, so <laughs> I'm sorry. But, <laughs> yeah, but Ray, you know, think about all of the, I mean, just about every profession right now has some kind of assessment tool that helps to predict the success of people coming into that occupation, right? Mm -hmm. um, then they have assessment tools that are based upon your personality and how it applies to a particular occupation. Yeah. To my knowledge, we don't do a lot of this in the education field. It's like, oh, you want to teach? You got a degree? We got a job for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> you to death, right? Yeah. yeah. 
so there's opportunities for improving in that particular space. But I also think that we have spent a lot of money on developing assessments and people are eating it up because they want to be assessed. They want to know about themselves <laughs> right, and how they interface and engage with other people. Um, and there's a lot of money to be made there. But are we bringing that same amount of resources to the field of education? Right. And to the field of assessing our children in terms of their learning, not only their capacity, but their status. Yeah. So so next question, Lauren, this is a layup question for you. I know it, but I'm going to come to you anyway. Um, uh, if you could design a school in the image of your founders, uh, what would be some key components of that school design? Yeah, um, I love it. I, I want to like actually even tie what we were just talking about into this um, because I feel like what we what we aren't talking enough about um, is the community. So like the, to me, the only way that you beat the union <laughs> um, is like through an uproar or an uprising from like the community and the people who are actually receiving the supports. And as I think about obviously our organization founded by school teachers and folks that were very involved um, and really took the bet, like we all have our different bets on how, we, how we're gonna get to the, the world that we want. Um, Sigma Gamma Rho's historical bet was in the education of young people, um, specifically young people. Um, and I think that there's always gonna be like a community pull here. Um, and something that I think testing does that we don't always recognize is um, allows for parents and, and other folks to understand, um, to be able to get mad and inform their own opinions about mm -hmm. what needs to happen. Um, it's an information tool. Um, it's, it's, it's providing knowledge. And so I think, um, I think if I was creating kind of the ideal school, it would be very rooted in, um, in the community that it's in, um, supporting the community. So if it's a black school and it needs to be for black kids, that's what it would be. Um, and it would be really centered in, in the empowerment and liberation of people um, alongside the academics. That's what's up. All right, so uh, Mr. Woods, we'll come to you, sir. You're muted. Uh, when, I look, when I look at the history of our founders and, and where they came from and, and, and how we, you know, we were, we were established on, uh, I think all three of our organizations are established on PWIs. So um, it, was, it was about the collective. It was about ensuring that each and every one of us were going to be successful in the, in the area um, that was uh, where we were. So it wasn't about, you know, um, we don't have, and, and, and kind of in a sense that blaming, blaming the white man for not having, it was like, you know what, we're going to equip you with the tools so that you can overcome any adversities, any obstacles that you have. So I, I would say that, we would design. We would design a school for those people to to achieve in, in the highest the highest levels that they could when they went out into whatever that that profession that endeavor that endeavor was. So equip them with you know. In this, we know that the 21st century is 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 STEM. So we're going we're going to focus heavily on on STEM because we know if you can do that, you can do all all sorts of other things if you choose to do those things. Yes, sir. All right, uh, uh, Swanson. All right. So I know a lot of people think about Alpha as the founders of the D9 and the ones who started this aspect of it, which is great. But it's also important to note that three of our founders were went on to become educators as well. And uh, two of the other founders, one was an architect, one was an engineer. And so in terms of uh, embracing academic excellence, I think these men did that. Um, but to answer your question, in addition to that, when you talked about building in the image of is, I mean, these men were leaders, right? If you think about it, back in 1905, seven African-American men got together at an Ivy League institution, Cornell University. And they did that with the interest of fostering community. They did that in the interest of academic success. They did that in the interest of fellowshipping with one another in a way that would help them uh, achieve the goal, which was a degree at a, at a time when, when not many folks were in college, let alone at Ivy League institutions. Uh, so my answer to your question would be, I love the idea of leadership. I love the idea of academic excellence. I love the idea of finishing. And then I love the idea of going on and leaving your stamp and your legacy in your chosen occupation. 
Hey, I should have started with you because I knew you was going to do that that whole first uh, divine, whatever. I, I, I knew you were going to do that. And so it, 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 let me correct the record for, for <laughs> folks that are listening. Uh, of course, actual fraternity, if we're going to talk about that, would be Prince Hall Masons. And then secondly, prior to you guys, Sigma Pi Phi fraternity. The Boule fraternity was actually the first fraternity, but I, but but I'm I'm that's neither here nor there. All right. <laughs> well, just for clarity, though, Ray, I didn't say the first fraternity. I, I said saw, I, I know what you said. Nine, <laughs> and it is the first college fraternity. But you are correct about the other. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, we got a question from 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 the audience because they're trying to kick us off here. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a major hurdle to uh, to charter school openings rests in, in the power of the authorizers. How can we disrupt the process and have states turn over decision making to black and brown uh, institutions and people? Um, Swanson, we'll start with you because I know you got uh, some things going on in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, uh, the work that we're doing is really centered around policy changes. Um, I don't know that um, we have advocated to specifically turn it over to black and brown folks, but I think we have continued to advocate for systemic change that makes it a little bit more uh, open and friendly for all of our communities. So uh, being active at school board meetings, uh, encouraging our folks to take positions in school administration, uh, and I think lobbying our folks, and we always have the power of the ballot in the words of John Lewis, um, we need to go do what we can to vote out folks. If you look at it, we have a lot of um, school districts that are hostile to the charter school movement. And so um, we are producing great results in the charter school space, uh, in many cases outperforming. And so all of your uh, anger and uh, uh, rancor, uh, Raymond, about uh, this, the <laughs> teachers unions, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, that is real and we're gonna find a way to navigate that politically because it obviously is a challenge. Uh, but to, 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 to summarize, we just need to be a lot more active and engaged in school board meetings and school districts and we need to have our people run for those positions. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Lauren, anything to add? Yeah, no, that, that sounds right. Um, I know that a more technical answer to these questions could very state by state. I know that Dr. Fuller was incredibly involved here um, in Milwaukee and Wisconsin um, around creating different authorizers so that there were different opportunities to, um, to make sure that you could open your schools. Um, I do think it, it comes down to policy though as well and, and accountability. So really knowing who makes that decision um, in your state and who has the power to, to change it. Um, and then the the question about just eliminating white people is I feel like a separate panel, but but I think that I think that electing and running it does it does say something though to to how we are teaching um, things like government and civics to our own people though and and demystifying the election process and what it what it means to run for office and hold positions because I do think that there's a ton of opportunity and we just don't talk about that enough or get folks moving enough um, in that direction. Yeah, so real quick, shout out to my authorizer, uh, the Board of Regents, New York State. Uh, they allow me uh, flexibility to do the things that I need to do. Uh, David Frank, uh, love to you, sir, and, uh, and, and continue blessings. And so I got to shout out my authorizer, you know, because I, I need, you know. So last question, we got, we got some Sigma in here who's feeling by himself. He's a solo, so of course they always feel like by themselves anyway. So um, <laughs> his question is, uh, we all know that uh, result of, as a result of the pandemic, the learning gap for black and brown students is sure to widen, absolutely. The, uh, the bottom line is that uh, online learning is not as effective for many of our students as in-person learning. Uh, as black Greek letter organizations, what can we do uh, uh, collectively uh, to get ahead of this issue that, that we know is coming? Uh, Dr. Jesse Kilgore Jr., Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, 31589. Jesus Christ, he's he's lonely. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Woods, we start with you, sir. What can we do as so, a collective? So, so you know, this is this is a, a a severely nuanced question because what we're dealing with is a health issue that in in a lot of respects will not allow us to physically um, aid and assist as we, as we would if we were in person. 
Um, so the, the, the tools that we're going to be able to provide for people are still going to be um, those on a, on a web social media platform. Um, what we just need to do is identify those, those, those tools and those things that are working best for parents to uh, continue to equip them and being able to uh, make sure that their children are, are, are ahead of the curve. I mean, this, this is one of those Lord Rilling and the Creek don't rise, you know, we'll be back in, in schools, you know, in the fall, but it, this is a tough, this is a tough question because every, I mean, Everybody is suffering. I, I think in in every aspect. I mean, in, in what we're doing, uh, co companies. I mean, are dealing with the same with the same things as far as um, th this this whole uh, uh, platform of, of of distance this distance learning. And we know that um, psychologists have said kids need to be in physical contact with one another so that they can collaboratively learn from one. Hey, bail, bail out your fraternity brother, uh, uh, Lauren. Bail him out. He's freezing. Stop. Bail him out. Um, <laughs> he's back. Wait, he's, go ahead. Am I, did, I, did I go away? Hey, hey, you Indiana, away was about to, Indiana was about to save you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, we, we just we just have to, uh, I, I don't know if y'all can hear me, but something happened with my video. We can hear um, you. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, we just we just have to uh, um, just like I said, hope hope that this pandemic is is over with soon. But just equip parents the best that we can with with the tools and resources that when we find out information, get that information out through through our various organizations to uh, to our uh, various mentoring uh, platforms so that we can we can assist. All right, Lauren, and then we're closing out with you, Mr. Swanson. Yeah, I um. So much here, but I think the fact that you named specifically what we need to be doing within our locus of control and our organizations, I think is one just really, we, we're all, you know, college graduates, like we understand the value of education. So we have to be the ones that are taking responsibility for all of our, our kids. Um, and I'm feeling that sense of responsibility, even as I exit this panel today, um, to make sure that our local chapter, IOTA Psi Sigma here in Wisconsin, is really, you know, being responsible for the learning that's happening in the community that we say we're serving. Because I don't know how we can really say that we're doing, that we're lifting our community or committed to community service and scholarship and excellence without knowing how our kids are doing. Um, and so I think there's also been a lot of creative efforts that other, that other folks are doing with creating smaller schools or looking outside the box when it comes to what, what education looks like and we're we're survivors so we know how to make it work we just have to put our put our minds to it and decide that it's a priority and i think the greek community specifically um should be driving that should be driving that um urgency all right bring us home first the first bring us home first fan <laughs> well first of all let's say to dr kilgore that we did shout out john lewis so phi beta sigma should not feel uh totally <laughs> only in this conversation right here. Um, but no, I think Lauren said it very well, but I think there's one other thing that we can do. And that is um, our organizations have a tremendous amount of capital collectively, and we don't necessarily channel it in ways always that we could do some really good things. Wouldn't it be something if our organizations endowed some teachers at mm. some different struggling schools and brought in some talent and we were able to actually financially resource that. Um, I'm gonna take that conversation back in alpha and see if we can move with that. And if we have charter schools in our areas that are um, performing at a standard that helps our children, we should be supporting that school in those ways. Absolutely. So uh, thank you all for joining us on this panel. Ryan, you gonna close us out? I will definitely close this out and say first, thank you to Ray for, for doing an incredible job moderating, but thank you all to the panelists, uh, Dundrell, uh, Tim, Lauren, thank you. Your, your comments were insightful. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm very happy in terms of your participation and where, where all of our respective organizations are going in the future based on uh, the leadership that, that you all have shown here on this. Uh, what I would love for people to do because it is a public uh, a forum is, is it kind of tied up in a bow. We want to keep encouraging people of color to raise the issue of self-determination with your chapter, with your region, then with your national organization, if you're a member of the D9, 
not to not only create schools where it's feasible, but support existing charter schools run by people of color. It's our history, it's in our DNA, whether you're an African-American, whether you're a Latinx, whether you're Native American, whether you're Asian American, to create schools that deliver for your population in ways that the traditional district schools historically have not. And so we, if it's been in our DNA, before they were charter schools, we did private schools, uh, we should be continuing that. There's nothing wrong with saying, I wanna create something for us and by us for the benefit of us. And I wanna encourage people to do that, not only with existing schools, but join a board of a, of a charter school run by a person of color, mentor, fundraise for these schools, get involved with any school and advocate for more of these schools being run by people of color, wherever they are. There's some people who asked questions that we couldn't get to that talked about, uh, so I need help to start a school that will be uh, 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 culturally aware and culturally sensitive and actually provide a uh, high quality education for our kids. Get involved in that struggle, get involved in that fight because it benefits the community and it benefits all of our organizations and helps us to keep growing. So thank you all. Uh, for those who are uh, part of our, our conference uh, convening, uh, you know where our next uh, session is going to be. But again, thank you all for participating. I look forward to continuing the discussion and continuing the, uh, the work going forward. Thank you so much. <laughs>